today is true religion. How many of you want true religion? What is true religion? Huh? Jesus Christ, okay. What else? Helping the widows and orphans, okay. Any other thoughts? Uh, re- yes, amen. So, they're all right. And I'm going to embellish on a few of them today. So, if you have your Bibles, James chapter 1, you know it'll be on the screen, 26 and 27. We're finishing James chapter 1, so next week we'll be in James 2. But verse 26, if anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure religion, pure and undefiled religion. How many of you want pure and undefiled religion? Here we go, Juan. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To visit, to visit, everybody say visit. Orphans and widows in their trouble. And, and I never hear this part stated. I always hear visit widows and orphans, but I never hear this part. To keep oneself unspotted from the world. I always hear the widows and orphans part, but I never hear be unspotted for the world. Father, as we come to you today, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that, Lord, that we'd be transformed by the hearing of the word, that, Lord, as we come today to partake of the Lord's Supper, to partake in what Jesus has done for us, that, Lord, that we would come truly unspotted by the world today. And, Lord, because of what you're doing in us, And because of the power of the blood of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful time we can be together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. You know, as I look through chapter 1, I I read it a lot. Um, Three times in here, James mentions about not being deceived. With this chapter focusing on how we should go through trials... There's something about going through trials and not getting deceived that James is really trying to drive home to us. You know, I've been studying on cults. That's a class I've been teaching in college, so I've been studying it, different cults. And it's crazy, Maggie, what they believe in. Oh, my gosh. I, I mean, I'm going through this stuff, and it's just like, and having to talk about it is even worse. I'm like, I don't, I don't like teaching this class. It's driving me nuts, man, because it's crazy, the stuff that's coming at us. So um, as I've been studying this, there's a couple of things about cults you need to know. Number one, they all deny the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is not God. And number two, many that join cults are dissatisfied Christians. Number three, they target people going through trials people seem to know when when you're going through a trial because for most people you can see it on their face you can see how they walk they're downtrodden there's a weight on them the frown I have to pull my frown because I smile that's what happens the Mormons believe that that Jesus is the brother of Satan. That God has a wife, and Jesus was the firstborn of God, and Satan is the secondborn of God. The Jehovah Witness believe that Jesus was the archangel Michael. The Muslims believe that Jesus coming back to be a servant to the twelfth Iman. Twelfth Iman disappeared when he was twelve years old and they believe that he's coming back and that Jesus will come back as his servant they believe that a catastrophe is what's going to bring him back and they believe they can cause the catastrophe to bring him back so when they say Iran is got going to have you know working on nuclear weapons and stuff they'll use it to bring back the 12th Iman 
And they believe Jesus is coming back with him as um, his servant. So when you see on Facebook and the social networks that even the Muslims believe Jesus is coming back, they do, but not as Savior. They believe he's coming back as a servant to the Imam. So don't let that get you all excited that even the Muslims believe because they do not believe the same God as we do. But when you deify Christ, you've missed the mark already. Jesus is the only way. Everybody say, only way. Everybody say, the truth. Everybody say, the life. That will lead you to God as Father. Somebody said, hey, all ways lead to God. Absolutely. Every way leads to God. You're either going to go to God as your father, or are you going to go to him as your judge? I'm going to go as him, my father. Amen. Amen? Amen? Because the word declares that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's going to happen. So everybody's going to stand before God. But he's either going to say, enter in, or I do not know you. How many of you want that enter in? Yeah, that's all I want to hear, man. Come on in. <laughs> you know, uh, but anything else besides that is deception. And as I said, chapter 1 mentions deception three times. But the three times it mentions it, it's a different word in the Greek, all three times. So there, there's something different about the deceptions. The first time he mentions it is in verse 16. And it's talking about everything that is good comes from God. Evil temptation comes from the devil. Or temptation comes from the devil. So verse 16 says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Do not be deceived. And, and that word means to roam, to go astray, to be deceived, to err, to seduce, to wander, to be, to be out of the way. Jesus is the, the way. Remember, so if Jesus is the way, and, and to be deceived here means to be out of the way, and if Jesus is the way, the only way to the Father, and we're out of the way, where are we heading? You get the idea? We're not going towards the Father. So that's the first thing about being deceived. Um, and it's talking about everything good comes from God, Ray. So when, when something bad comes against you and you blame God, you're deceived. When you think, if you think that God put a sickness on you, you're deceived. You see, it just doesn't make sense. Think about it. It doesn't make sense, Michael, for, for God to put sickness on you and then for God to rebuke it. Or, let's go one step further. Doesn't make sense for God to put sickness on you when he sent his son Jesus to pay the price for it all. It doesn't make sense. So when we say, oh, why did God, why is God doing this to me? You're deceived. Out of your own mouth, you're being deceived. Because God is what? He's good. He's not going to put evil things on you. That camera puts 10 pounds on you, I'm telling you. Come on, Dean. So when we start blaming God for the evil that is happening in our lives, we're stepping out of the way. We're getting out of the way. A lot of things that we go through are just simply our own decisions. But 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No. Everybody say no. No, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, you will also, he will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So when temptation comes, God will always provide a way out. So if God's going to provide a way out, why would he tempt you in the first place? So don't blame God for your issues. It's not God. In understanding this, well, I've already covered this, um, but verse, let's go to number 2, verse 22. It says, hearing the word and not doing it is deception. 
And then verse 22 says, be, do, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So when we hear the word and we don't do it, we're deceiving ourselves. That word means to misreckon, to delude, to beguile, to de be deceived. So it's, it's like when we hear the word and we don't do it, we're deluding the word of God. We're making it void in our lives. It's just like washing through. So when you hear the word and you don't make it a part of your life, you're diluting the word, you're making it of no value in your life, you're deceived. You're disobedient, you're prideful, and you're arrogant. Because we don't, you know, when that happens, you don't think you need to be changed by the word of God. You're not changing, allowing your mind to be changed. So that's when the pride, the arrogance sets in and, and the deception comes to life. Verse 26 says, thinking, number three, verse 26, it says, thinking you're religious and not holding your tongue. He declares your righteous religiousness useless. So if we don't, if we, as Christians, we don't hold our tongue, our religion is useless. And so in that word there, being deceived, it says, if anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. And what that means in there, uh, deceived, it means to cheat. You're cheating yourself. It means, again, deluded. It, and deceived. So, but cheat, delude, deceive. When you don't hold your tongue, that's what's happening. So you're, you're cheating yourselves and you're cheating those around you. And this brings us into our topic of discussion today, which number one would be bridle your tongue. Bridle your tongue. When you, when, <laughs> when you bridle a horse, you put a bit in his mouth. So he, wow. Not a lot coming out of his mouth. Because <laughs> he's got that big old thing in his mouth. And sometimes we need that big old thing in our mouth to stop us from uh, speaking. <laughs> There's a story in the Old Testament. It's in Judges chapter 11, verse 29 through um, 31. And it's one of the judges, um, Jephthah. And in verse 29, it says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed through Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he advanced toward the people of Ammon. And Jeho Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. Now, the Spirit of the Lord had already come upon him, and he, now he makes a vow to the Lord. If you indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that... Whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Sounds so special, doesn't it? But it's, let me just tell you this. God does not need your help. Okay? When God's spirit comes upon you, he does not need you make a vow of commitment for something crazy. Okay, that's number one. God does not need your help. The other night, we had great meetings this week with John Harkey. It was so powerful. And uh, God was moving. There were so many prophetic words, strong prophetic words, released for this house of what God's doing. But the other night, there was a, a young lady uh, that had a, I mean, a huge goiter on her neck. And there was a lady from another church that, that brought her. And they drove from Yucca Valley to, to get here that night for the meeting. But she's just crying for this little girl. And she's laying hands on her and she's praying and she said, God, take it off of her and put it on me. Really? God's not big enough to do it on his own? That he don't, could you, wouldn't that have been so funny if it would have came off of her and went on that, that lady? I would have laughed. Because it's crazy to talk that way. God is big enough to do it on his own. He doesn't need our help. Amen? And, and then, um, 
I was just put in my nose, what would that lady have done if that would have happened? What if we would all come into agreement with that lady and God said, we're two or more gathered. Woo! And that lady, and that little girl, that would have been crazy, Rick. We would have been like, oh my gosh. And then that lady would have been all jacked up. But Jephthah, he spoke without speaking. He wasn't thinking about, hey, I got family at home. He wasn't thinking about his wife, his servants, his daughter. He wasn't thinking about who might come out of the house. This was his flesh. It's not of the spirit when we do things like that. He just couldn't contain himself. God, you give me this, I'll give you that. And so here, let's look at verse 34, what happened. When Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing. And she was the, his only child. Besides her, he had no other son nor daughter. She was the first one out of the house. And it came to pass, verse 35, when he saw her, that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you've brought me very low. She didn't do anything. He is low because of the words that came out of his mouth because he couldn't bridle his tongue. See, when we don't bridle, like that lady, when we don't bridle our tongue, we open ourselves up to the attack of the enemy. That's why I I encourage people, don't pray for salvation for a loved one. Don't say, God, whatever you got to do, however low you got to bring them, don't pray that way for people. Come on. Man, you say, hey, God, whatever you got to do, just go ahead and do it. How low you got to bring them, it doesn't matter. Man, I'm tired of trying to Suck people up out of the mud. Listen, it says me, my whole household will be saved. I don't have to pray that way. I can just begin to rejoice that my whole household saved. Amen? And because when you pray, God, whatever it takes, the devil's just unleashed. And that life gets destroyed. Don't pray. Pray, pray the word of God. I thank you, Lord, and me and my whole household will be saved. Let's bridle our tongue when it comes to that so that we can see them come to life. Alas, my daughter, you've brought me very low. You know, we pray that way and then we get low because we see what they're going through to get to be an answer to your prayer. I remember one time, man, my, uh, I was in China ministering and we were having this great healing service. I mean, people were getting healed from arthritis. It was just incredible. Emphysema. God was moving. And my translator, my son, Timothy, he comes to me and he says, Hey, Dad, my stomach's not feeling real good. And I said, Well, you just eat everything they put in front of you, man. No wonder, you know. And so I said, Let me pray for you. And I put my hand on his stomach. I said, Whatever's in there, I command it to come out in Jesus' name. That guy got violently sick. He was throwing up so bad. I said, Tim, here I prayed for you and everything. I'm so sorry. And he goes, no, no, Dad, it's okay. What you prayed happened. It's coming out. (laughs) I do not pray that way anymore for people. Because that poor guy, man, we were on a farm in China, and they started doing um, ancient Chinese medicine on him, and he was a little scared. I was... (laughs) I was a little freaked out watching. (laughs) I said, wait, 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 let's pray again. (laughs) But when you read this story of of Jephthah, it's an extreme story about learning to bridle your tongue. He did sacrifice his daughter. He gave her two months, and then he sacrificed her. But how about when we don't bridle our tongue and we lie or we deceive? Or we flatter, or we curse, we swear. I don't know, you, you, you could fill in the blank. Proverbs 18, 21, it says, Death, life, the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruit. We're either producing life or death with our tongue. And we're going to reap the consequences of our tongue. If I keep telling the chair... It's ugly. It will be ugly. But if I keep on telling the chair it's beautiful, it'll be beautiful. See, it's that way with people. If we build up, they'll be built up. If we tear down, they'll be torn down. 
power of our words. So how do we do it? Mark 16 explains it really well. Verse 17. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Everybody say new tongues. New tongues. You get a new tongue when you become a believer in Jesus Christ. Now listen, when I got my new tongue, I prayed in a heavenly language. But my English changed. From a Friday to a Monday, I stopped cussing and swearing. I got a new tongue. I mean, I really, I got a new tongue. It transformed my life. I mean, I received a heavenly language, Matthew, that I could pray in the Spirit all the time. But I stopped cussing and swearing and saying, dropping F-bombs everywhere. I just stopped totally. It was gone. It was gone. Hallelujah. Amen. A believer gets a new tongue. Everybody say new. new. Come on, new. new. The key to it is that you don't receive or believe if you're being deceived by the enemy of your soul. It, ca it causes me to allow things to become new. Old things are truly passed away. Wait a minute, I skipped a whole bunch here. It's possible to change your mindsets on this. It's possible. I believed it. I knew I was changed. I received it. So number two, so the first one is bridle your tongue. The second one is visit the widows and the orphans in their trouble when they're having a tough time. People like to think that that is the only purity to religion that this alone is it I, I, I hear this a lot I don't have religion I have relationship come on what's the matter with a little religion pure religion what's the matter with visiting the widows and orphans in their time of need I like religion I don't like to be religious in the sense that I, I have a religious spirit but pure religion is a good thing it's, a, it's an awesome thing. When you have pure, pure religion, you're not self-centered. You're not focused on yourself all the time. You're thinking about the orphan and the widow. You're not self-centered. You can have a relationship all you want, but you also need to have religion. Listen, I have a relationship with my wife, but it can be really bad too. I could say bad things to her, or she could say bad things to me. I could not talk to her. I could not have fellowship with her, but I still have a relationship with her. We can have a relationship with God, and it stinks. But when I fall into pure religion, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to visit the widows, visit the orphans. And then, number three, I'm going to keep myself unspotted from the world. If you walked into a coal mine in a white suit, and you just walked and didn't touch anything, you're going to come out black. Because it's all around you. So staying unspotted from the world takes an effort on our part. This is pure religion. That we don't look like the world. That's the idea. We don't go through the trials like the world goes through trials. That doesn't mean we don't go through trials. It's just that our attitude and our actions are different than the way that the world goes through them. That's what we've been talking about this whole month and a half. We don't talk like the world. We don't blame God for our problems. We're quick to hear. We're slow to speak. We're slow to anger. Pure religion means there's none of the world alive in me. It's way deeper than just having a relationship. The relationship is so deep that the the... the the religion in me is, is so pure that I don't want anything of the world on me or in me. I would be saying, <laughs> if my relationship isn't good, I say whatever I want, when I want. We only allow that for people 70 and above. <laughs> my mom cracks me up. Pure religion, I'd not think about what, I wouldn't think about what I say to Delonda. 
I'd constantly tear her down if I didn't have pure religion. I'd speak evil to her if I didn't have pure religion. But my religion causes me to have relationship with the Father, which causes me to bless my wife. There's nothing wrong with being religious in the purest sense. Widows and orphans and unspotted from the world. It causes me to speak with a new tongue. It causes me to allow all things to become new. It causes me to allow all things that are old to pass away. I speak life and not death. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we've come to you today and we hear your word. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you just speak to all of us right now. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you just begin playing the the reel of our lives right now. As we've come to the completion of James chapter 1 of how to go through trials, Lord, you've done an amazing job of putting it together so that we could come through trials with flying colors. You finished it with a purity of what you want to see in us. Lord, that we we would visit the the orphans and the widows in their trying times. And and Lord, that we wouldn't be walking around spotted like the world, with the world. We'd be unspotted. And Lord, you've challenged us here today to bridle our tongue. Lord, not just to say what we think. To be quick to hear, slow to speak is what you're challenged us. You've said, bridle your tongue, otherwise we're deceived. You told us to not blame you for the things that are evil or we're deceived. Lord, there's just so much that you're trying to explain to us in this about not being deceived. And you finish it with bridling our tongue. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Ron, I I need that bridle on my tongue today. I need a new tongue. I need to learn to refrain. I need the Holy Spirit to help me today. If that's you, just raise your hand. Amen, 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 amen. Praise God. Why don't we just stand together and we're going to ask if the communion service would come. Father, you you saw all these hands that went up right now. Lord, you know that new tongue, Lord, is not just a heavenly language, but it's it's our native language of English or Spanish or whatever, Father. I pray that right now there would be a renewed tongue just released in the people of God. That, Lord, that we could truly learn to bridle our tongue, that you'd break off, Lord, deception off of our lives today in the name of Jesus. Father, we don't want to be deceived. We want to hear those words one day. Enter in to your rest, thou good and faithful servant. We don't want to hear, I don't know you. Depart from me. So, Father God, for every hand that went up today, I I just pray just a cleansing over them right now. Lord, a washing of the word of God over us. Lord, that we would walk unspotted from the world before you and Lord that we would walk in pure religion Father and that Lord our words would bring life to each other and strength and if you're here today and you know Jesus you're qualified for communion and if you haven't committed your life to Jesus we can do that right now why don't you all just repeat this prayer after me dear Heavenly Father I thank you for your son Jesus, that he came for me, he died for me, he rose from the dead, and he's at your right hand, Father. Jesus, I repent of my sins. Forgive me of them. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me new today. In Jesus' name, amen. So 
Come, receive the emblems today, and then we'll take the communion together in a few moments. She put some music on, Marianne. just taking a bread or cracker and a juice this morning we're partaking of everything that Jesus did for us we're partaking of his life we're partaking of healing we're partaking of the forgiveness of sins we're partaking of the peace and the rest that we can have in Jesus amen so father we just thank you today for the body of Christ which was bruised and broken broken for each one of us. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three declares, For I received from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take the today if you need healing just to flow through your body right now just raise your hand right now Father you see all these hands we just pray right now for the healing power of the blood of Jesus to just come just wash through Lord as you've washed away our sins wash away infirmities right now in the name of Jesus just let it flow Father God let every body right now be made whole according to your word Lord Lord even blood be thinned out Father God blood be cleansed today in the name of Jesus lungs be open and healed the inner wall of the lung be healed right now in the name of Jesus Lord, knees be restored, Lord, that there could be a running take place in lives right now, Father God, of people that have been battling in the name of Jesus. Lord, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Lord, all migraine headaches, Lord, have to cease in the name of Jesus. Tumors and lumps must go in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. The power shed blood of Jesus Christ in the same manner he also took the cup after supper saying this cup of the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes let's take the cup hallelujah praise you Father we thank you Lord we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray just a covering over the people of God. Lord, like you did the Israelites, a cloud by day and a fire by night, Father. Let there be that supernatural covering over the people of God. Lord, to protect them from, Lord, being spotted by the world. Lord, that we would walk in pure religion. Lord, that our hearts just continue to be full of the Spirit of God. 
And Lord, we just give you praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Let's give the Lord a big clap today. Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. We're having Wednesday night service this week. Come and be a part of that. And then next week we have a family service on Tuesday, right before Thanksgiving, the Tuesday. So this will be the last Wednesday night service of the year. So come and be a part of that. Amen? Amen. All right. God bless.